the true story of how an exotic dancer became one of World War I's most notorious spies. Hit the subscription button and ring the notification bell, this way you'll be the first to learn about the updates that appears on inspiring stories several times a day. It's 1916 and the First World War grinds on in Europe. A woman known as Mata Hari is in Madrid, neutral Spain's capital. She's there to see Major Arnold Cal, an officer serving at the German embassy. Hari hopes that Cal will be able to put her in touch with Germany's Crown Prince Wilhelm. What's unclear, however, is whether she's spying for the French or the Germans, or if she's simply in the game for money. Either way, things aren't going to end well for her. We'll come back to the puzzle of what exactly Mata Hari was up to in Madrid a little later. But for the moment, let's get to know this notorious courtesan, erotic performer and alleged secret agent, or possibly double agent. She was born Margaretha Gertrude Zell in 1876 in the Dutch city of Leeuwarden. Zell was the firstborn of Ant van der Meulen and her husband Adam Zell, both in their mid-thirties at the time. The couple were to have another three children, in fact, all boys. Her father owned a successful milliner's store, and the family had enough money to give Zell and her siblings a comfortable early upbringing, with Margaretha attending upscale schools. But Zell's idyllic childhood and the lavish gifts her father had indulged her with came to an abrupt end when she was 13 years old. Her dad had made unwise investments in the oil industry and lost his fortune. Then, to make matters even worse, Adam left Anch for a woman he'd been having an affair with. To this unwelcome disruption was added the tragedy of Zell's mother's death just a couple of years later in 1891. Her daughter was just 15 at the time. It seems that for Zell, family life had more or less disintegrated. She subsequently went to stay at the home of her godfather, a Mr. Visser, in the Dutch city of Sneek. And the young Zell soon found herself in the first of the many scrapes she'd get into over the years. Aged 16, she went to train as a kindergarten teacher at an institution in the Dutch city of Leiden. But the headmaster of her school, who was married, started an affair with her. He was just the first of many men who would exploit Zell during her life. You might think that the headmaster should have borne the consequences of his abusive indiscretion. But, no, it was Zell who was thrown out of the school instead. The young woman now found herself in yet another Dutch city, The Hague. She lived there with her uncle and, clearly at a loose end, her life was to be changed forever by a newspaper advertisement. The advertisement in question had been placed by an army officer, Rudolf MacLeod, who despite his Scots name was actually in the Dutch Armed Forces. He was a captain in the country's colonial army serving the Dutch East Indies, today's Indonesia. The purpose of his newspaper advertisement was to find a wife. According to a 2017 National Geographic article, MacLeod sought a girl of pleasant character. Zell responded to MacLeod's ad and the two were wed in Amsterdam on July 11, 1895. Her new husband was 20 years her senior, and the marriage had both advantages and disadvantages. The benefits were that MacLeod was from an aristocratic family. His mother was the Baroness Weirds de Londres. That gave Zell social cachet and, hopefully, money. After their wedding the couple sailed for the island of Java, now part of Indonesia, in May 1897. They voyaged aboard the SS Princess Amalia, a steamer of the Netherlands Line. And following their arrival, they settled in the Javan city of Malang. It all must have seemed like quite an adventure for Zell, or Mrs. MacLeod as she now was. Indeed, she'd never been out of the Netherlands before. So, we've seen the apparent advantages of marrying MacLeod. But by any dispassionate judgment, the disadvantages of the marriage unfortunately outweighed the benefits by a wide margin. The captain was a heavy drinker, probably an alcoholic, and prone to physically assaulting Zell at regular intervals. For some reason. He held her responsible for his lack of advancement in his career. As for money, MacLeod was in fact heavily in debt. And that was hardly the worst of it. MacLeod also made no secret of the fact that he kept a concubine, 
which was apparently a routine practice for Dutch colonialists at the time. Zell didn't accept this state of affairs passively, though. Indeed. For a time, she left him and lived in with a Dutch officer called Van Reeds. McLeod begged Zell to come back, however, and after a time she did. Moreover, Zell's tumultuous relationship with McLeod was made all the more complicated by the fact that the couple had two children. The first, Norman John, had been born while the couple were still in Holland in January 1897. The second, Louise Jean, arrived after the McLeods had settled on Java in May of the following year. Then, on top of the hard drinking, the physical abuse and the infidelities, Zeld discovered that she had contracted syphilis from McLeod. This extremely unpleasant and dangerous sexually transmitted condition was apparently rife among the Dutch colonial armies in the East Indies. And because McLeod had given her the disease before she gave birth to their two children, they too were infected. In 1899, both the McLeod children became sick, quite likely because of the syphilis passed on to them by their parents. By now, McLeod had become a commander on Java, and he turned to the doctor of the garrison, where he and his family were stationed. This doctor had experience of treating adults for syphilis, probably with mercury. But he had no expertise in treating children. The result seems to have been that the children had a violent reaction to the doses of medicine that the doctor gave them. Norman John and Louise were left in great pain with severe convulsions and vomiting. In fact, tragically this affliction was so acute that it killed the young boy, although his sister survived. Moreover, there were rumors that the McLeod's nanny might have poisoned the children. The mooted motive for this act was that McLeod had assaulted the nanny's boyfriend, although the woman in question was never charged with any crime. But regardless of whether the poisoning was an accidental overdose or a deliberate act, the McLeods had still lost one of their children. And this tragedy seems to have pushed the McLeods even further apart. In 1900 they came back to the Netherlands, but their marriage was soon over. When the couple split up in 1902, Zell wanted to keep her daughter Louise. McLeod, however, failed to pay the maintenance he'd promised to. Since she was virtually penniless, this meant Zell eventually had to hand over custody of the child to her estranged husband. Zell subsequently settled in Paris in 1903. Now, she had to find a way of making a living. She tried her hand at a variety of jobs including teaching piano, modeling in a big store and giving German language classes. Then she found better paid work as a model for some of the many artists living in the city. And that work also helped her to build connections with the theater world. Next, in 1905 came the invention of Mata Hari, the exotic dancer. And since Margareta Zell now called herself Mata Hari, we'll follow suit from now on. This was apparently a Malaysian phrase meaning eye of the day or sunrise. Her first show was at a Parisian gallery specializing in Asian artworks, the Musée Gimit. Hundreds of people from the cultural elite of Paris were invited, and Mata Hari danced for them in glittering lingerie, diaphanous veils and extravagant headwear. What's more, her glamorous new persona was an instant hit in the French capital. Hari's dancing has been described as erotic, and through this medium she recounted stories of passion and lust. To avoid charges of indecency for her risque act, though, Hari always framed her performances in the context of sacred rites of Hinduism from the East Indies. Indeed, a 2017 article in National Geographic quoted the words that Hari used to sidestep the attentions of the authorities at a time of censorious moral standards. My dance is a sacred poem, Mata Hari would tell her audiences. One must always translate the three stages that correspond to the divine attributes of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, creation, fecundity, destruction, she would add. And for good measure, she would give her explanation in several languages including English, French, and Malay. Perhaps some of her audience's enthusiasm was indeed for Mata Hari's celebration of the sacred. But others almost certainly enjoyed the thrill of the forbidden and the profane. In truth, though, 
Hari's act was rather more modest than it appeared, since she always wore a flesh-colored body stocking on stage. And Hari also always kept her bejeweled bra on because she was uneasy about her body shape. Nonetheless, her performances brought her great fame, not to mention notoriety. She became the toast of French high society, in fact, or at least the male part of it. Moreover, her fame spread well beyond France, and she danced for enthusiastic audiences in many European cities over the years. And it seems that her wealthy fans were happy to provide her with the luxurious lifestyle of diamonds, furs and lavish hospitality. You can get a flavor of the impact Mata Hari's act had on many men from the words written by a journalist in Vienna and quoted on the biography website. Hari, he wrote, is slender and tall with the flexible grace of a wild animal and with blue-black hair. Another writer described her as so feline, extremely feminine, majestically tragic, the thousand curves and movements of her body trembling in a thousand rhythms. But it couldn't last forever. To a large extent, Mata Hari's appeal depended on her youth and beauty, and as the years passed those began to fade. Then, in 1914 the First World War erupted. Hari seems to have taken little notice of the impact that the conflict was having on so many people in Europe and elsewhere in the world, however. In fact, Hari continued to travel from city to city and to live an ostentatiously lavish lifestyle. As we've seen, however, her dancing career was now on the wane, and her final public performance came in March 1915. She was now forced to concentrate on exploiting her reputation as a courtesan and had a series of relationships with senior politicians and military figures. As a Dutch national, Mata Hari was the citizen of a neutral country. And this meant that she could continue with the international travel that had been a feature of her lifestyle for many years. In the later part of 1915 she was back in her home country in the city of The Hague. And there a chain of events started that would eventually lead to her downfall. Unwisely, Hari accepted a payment from a man named Karl Kromer of 20,000 francs, which amounts to around $60,000 in today's money. Cromer was the honorary consul for Germany in Amsterdam. And as far as he was concerned, the money was paid on the understanding that Hari would spy for the Germans during the war. Mata Hari appears not to have appreciated the possible consequences of accepting money from a foreign power, however, even if she didn't agree to spy for them. Instead, she seems to have believed that the cash was merely a fitting recompense for jewelry and expensive clothes that the Germans had confiscated from her when the war broke out. But that wasn't necessarily how others would see it. On her way back to France in December 1915, Hari was stopped at the English port of Folkestone. There, she was questioned by a British security officer. Although he found nothing concrete to imply wrongdoing in her luggage or during her interrogation, he was clearly suspicious. And in his notes about Hari, he made his beliefs all too clear. National Geographic quoted the officer's notes. She speaks French, English, Italian, Dutch and probably German. Handsome bold type of woodman. Well and fashionably dressed, he wrote. Not above suspicion, most unsatisfactory should be refused permission to return to the UK, he concluded. This British intelligence officer clearly believed he was dealing with a dangerous individual. Moreover, this was an omen of the kind of reception Mata Hari would face when she was back in France. Once she had settled into the Grand Hotel in Paris, in fact, the French Secret Service took a keen interest in her. She was followed everywhere on the orders of Georges Ledoux who was in charge of the French Ministry of War's counter-espionage department. In addition to shadowing Mata Hari, wherever she went in Paris, staff at the counter-espionage unit also opened her letters, bugged her telephone, and kept a meticulous record of everyone she met. Despite this, they still weren't able to provide any actual evidence that she was passing secrets to the Germans. Mata Hari, however, knew nothing about the attentions of the French intelligence agents. Meanwhile, she had fallen in love with a Russian officer named Vladimir de Maslov, who was a pilot fighting for the French. Maslov was severely wounded in 1916, and Hari was desperate to visit him. 
but as a foreigner, she wouldn't be permitted to travel near the front line during wartime. Now, however, via one of her lovers, Matahari made contact with agents from the very same French counter-espionage unit that had been following her. They offered her a deal, she would be able to see Maslov if she spied on Germany on behalf of the French. And they would pay her 1 million francs to do so, a huge sum at the time. Matahari was then ordered by Ladu himself to return the hate via Spain. However, he never gave her either money or detailed instructions. On her way to the Netherlands, she was again stopped by security officers in England. She told them she was working for Ladu. But when the British checked her story, Ladu denied all knowledge. Hari was subsequently shipped off back to Spain. While in Spain, Mata Hari actually did manage to discover from an indiscreet German official that his country intended to invade Morocco. After she made it back to France, she tried to pass on her information to Ledoux, but he would not meet with her. What's more, he now claimed to have evidence that she was indeed a German agent, which led to Hari's was arrest in February 1917. In fact, Ledoux was himself subsequently arrested on suspicion of being a spy, although he would later be released. At Matahari's trial in July 1917, the main evidence against her came from Ledoux. She was found guilty and sentenced to death by firing squad. Historians have subsequently discredited Ledoux's evidence, however. Nonetheless, Hari was executed on October 15, 1917. Brave in the face of death, she refused to be bound and stood proudly as she was shut. And because she's so well known as a traitorous spy, it's shocking to discover that the glamorous and mysterious Mata Hari almost certainly didn't betray the Allies. We hope you enjoyed the video, please let us know which one of these stories you found the most interesting. And if you like the video, click on the subscription button and turn on notification so you will be the first to know when we put out a new video. We thank you for watching, and we hope to see you next time.